Welcome to Game Founder Reviews. In this video, we're going to take a look at Princes of Florence. Princes of Florence is set in the Renaissance in which players are building up their own principality to attract artists and scholars and things like that to their area. Let's jump right in with the description of the rules, see if the example turns being played, then I'll be back for some closing remarks. This is Princes of Florence, set up for a three-player game. To set up, each player just picks a color and takes their corresponding marker and places their figure on the 050 space of the fame or points track. Each player takes 3,500 florin. In a two-player game, you actually get 2,500 florin, but in three plus, it's 3,500. Then you're going to shuffle out the profession cards, deal each player a hand of four. They're going to look at them, put one back into the deck, and the deck is going to be reshuffled. So they're going to end up with a hand of three cards for their eyes only. Then you just arrange all the game pieces by type, like you can see here. The recruiting cards can stay face up because they're all exactly the same, but the bonus cards and the prestige cards should be shuffled to form a face down stack of each. You normally include all the components of each type as they are limited, but freedoms, you're always gonna have the same number of each different freedom. There's three different types as the number of players minus one. So we're a three player game, so there's two of each type of freedom. In a two player game, you're gonna have one of each freedom, and then you're gonna put two other random freedoms. So it's possible that you may not have two of this type, but two of the other, for instance. Aside from that, you just put the round marker in the first round to indicate that we're starting the game in round one, and you give the starting player this figure here. The game is played over seven rounds, which you can see in this table here, composed of two phases, which are the auction phase and the action phase. The game ends at the end of the seventh round, upon which there is a final scoring of prestige cards. At this time, whoever has the most prestige points is going to be the winner of the game. The auction phase is going to begin with the start player and then proceed clockwise. On your turn, you get to pick a group to bid on or pass. Um, when you pick a group to bid on, you can only pick from these seven up top, which are forest lakes, parks, recruiting cards, prestige cards, jesters, and builders. These other things are going to be in use during the action phase part of the game. But when you pick a group, you automatically start the bidding at 200 florins. You, by picking it, have bid 200, and it's going to proceed clockwise. Players can increase the bid by exactly 100. So if this player picks forests here, he automatically bids 200, then this player can either pass or go up to 300. They can't go up to 400 or anything like that. And it's going to continue around until all but one player have passed. Once you pass, you cannot re-enter the bid, at which time that player pays the money to the bank and claims that group. We'll talk about what happens with different things, but once you claim a group, you're going to mark it with your marker so nobody else can pick that group or bid on that group the rest of this phase. Also, each player can only buy one thing per auction phase. So in this example, if this guy picked the group and bought this, when this guy picks a group, he's not going to be able to bid on anything. It's also important to note that if you pass, meaning you don't pick a group at all, you don't get to bid on anything, including anything else anybody picks. So you're either bidding or just sacrificing the right to bid for the whole turn. So in this particular example, the guy who started the bid won it. So then it's going to proceed to the next player who hasn't bought anything to pick a bid. Because remember, once you've bought something, you can't uh, bid. And just by picking a bid, you've already bid 200 florins or 300 florins in the two-player game. But let's pretend for a second that this gray player over here did pick the forest and everybody bid, but this blue player ended up winning it. So since he picked, he can now pick again or pass because he didn't win anything yet. So he could then pick the jesters, for instance, and bid on them. And him and the red player could bid. The blue player could not bid because he's already bought something. And of course, he could not pick to bid on the forest because they've already been bought this auction phase. So the auction phase continues like this until all players have had a chance to buy something or have passed, at which point players just take their markers back to their area. Before we move on to the action phase, let's briefly go over what you do with the different objects when you buy them. If you buy a forest, lake, or park, you just immediately put them in your principality somewhere where they fit. It has to be on empty spaces, can't overlap with anything, but can essentially put them wherever you'd like. Um, once you place them, though, you cannot move them later, so keep that in mind. It's also important to note that if you later place another one of the same type, so I already have a forest, I place another forest, I immediately get three points, and that applies for all of them. However, if I already have a forest and I place a lake, I don't get three points because a lake and a forest are different. Next are the builders and they go in these spaces up here and you always fill from left to right and you are limited to three maximum of these as indicated on your board here but just like lakes and parks and forests if you place a second one and a third one you get three points for each extra one that you end up placing these jesters they just go in your palazzo which is just this building down here and uh, they're going to give you two points many times throughout the game so they're good to hold on to next is prestige cards and you draw five of these you're just going to draw five from the top of the deck or the whole deck if there's less than five remaining. And you're going to choose one, add it to your hand, and then put the other four back on the bottom of this deck in any order that you'd like. And finally is recruiting cards. They're all the same, so you just draw one to your hand. You can use recruiting cards at any time. You can even use them as soon as you buy them. All you do is you just place them on a profession card that's face up on the board. You take that profession card to your hand, and this card essentially replaces it. For all game purposes, this counts as a profession card. So uh, that's basically what it does. We'll get into that a little bit more later. So that brings us to the action phase. During the action phase, the start player begins and play proceeds clockwise. On a player's turn, they can execute up to two actions per turn. And there are five possible actions that players can take, which are complete a work, build a building, acquire a bonus card, take a profession, or introduce a freedom. We're going to go over each of those in detail now. 
So the first action you can take is to complete a work, and you can do this one or two times in a turn. And the way you do that is you're going to play a profession card from your hand. We have here the Dramatist, and you'll see different values here. So if he has a theater, he's going to get some extra points and things like that. But you're going to play that in your area, and you're going to calculate the score. In order to complete a work at all, you have to at least get as many points indicated in the round table. So in the first round, you have to get at least seven points to even be able to complete a work. If your work's only worth six points or something like that, you can't do it at this time. The way to calculate the value of the work is, well, you first lay out this card face up in the play area for everybody to see it, and then you're going to add different points for buildings, landscapes, and freedoms, as indicated on the card. So in this case, he gets four points if you have the theater in your area. He gets three points if you have a park, although I want to note that even if you have ten parks, you still only get three points. And if he has the religious freedom, he gets another three points. And also for every jester you have in your palazzo, you get two extra points. And then for each profession card you have in your hand and in your play area, you get one extra point. And this includes recruiting cards. So if somebody else used a recruiting card in your area and took one of your uh, profession cards, you still get points for this. For all game purposes, the recruiting card counts as a profession card. You can also play bonus cards at this time to get extra points. So for instance, bonus for each forest, you're going to get two points as an example of a card from the top of the deck. And you can do things like that to increase the work value. As long as your sum at least equals the minimum for the round, you get to put your marker out on the board. So let's just pretend when we added all these things together in our bonus cards that we played, we were at 15. So we would put out on the 15 space. We don't move our points. We didn't get 15 points yet. And you take that much money. So if we got 15, we would take 1,500 florins. You always multiply by 100 for how many florins you get. And at this time, you can exchange some of the florins you just got for points at a two to one ratio. So what I mean by that is you could take 1,500 florins and no points, or you could take 1,300 florins and one point, or 1,100 florins and two points, and when you get points, you do move this guy along the board, all the way up to 100 florin and seven points. And that's just because 15 or 1,500 in our case was not divisible by two. If we had 16 work value or 1,600 florins, we could go all the way to zero florins or zero money and eight points. It's also possible that you complete two works during a turn. If you do that, you don't add the value. You just put this on the highest work value you completed for the turn. So if I completed a 20 and a 15, it's not going to be at 35. It's just going to be at 20 for the round. The next action you can take is to build a building and like complete a work. You can do this one or two times during a turn as one of your two actions. You pay 700 to the bank and you can build a building in your area. Also, whenever you build a building, you immediately get three points. You're going to take those on the prestige track with your figure. So when you place it in your area, it has to be not adjacent to any other buildings. And that includes the palazzo. Corner to corner is okay, like so. But if I was here, they're sharing a straight edge. So that would be an illegal placement. It is okay for them to be adjacent to landscapes like the forest there. But otherwise, you can only build each type of building once so if I already had this here I could never build another studio. The builders do change the rules of building a little bit. The first builder lowers the cost to 300 instead of 700. The second builder does allow you to put buildings adjacent to other buildings and the third builder makes building totally free. The next action you can do is to acquire a bonus card and when you acquire a bonus card you have to pay 300 florins um, and then you're just going to draw five of these to your hand look at them pick one put the other four back on the bottom of the deck in any order. And then you have yourself a bonus card. Like complete a work or build a building, you can do this one or two times during a turn as part of your two actions. And uh, you just play these when you're completing works to get extra points. Another action you can do is to take a profession card. And that works exactly the same as to acquire a bonus card in that you pay 300 money. You draw five of these or all of the cards if there's less than five in the deck. Choose one put in your hand, the rest go to the bottom of the deck in any order you want. But there is a limitation here in that you can only do this once per turn. Whereas for the other actions, you're allowed to do one or two times. Take a profession card is limited to one. And you'll have yourself a new profession card in your hand. The other action you can do, the final action, is also limited to once per turn. And these are introduced freedoms. And uh, just like bonus cards and professions, they cost 300 money to perform. So you pay 300 money to the bank and you take a freedom that you do not already have and you place it on the indicated space of your board like so. You can only ever acquire one of each type of freedom during the game. So after all players have taken their two actions for the turn, we're going to find out who has the best work. Whoever has their marker the farthest along this track here gets the best work for the round, and they're going to score three points. If everybody's tied or multiple people are tied, everybody gets those three points. And then you just remove the markers from the tracks. So you're going to take them back to your area. This marker itself wasn't worth any points. It was just to determine who had the biggest work for the turn. At this point, the round is over. You're just going to pass the start player one place clockwise, and you're going to move up to the next space. If the seventh round just finished, it's going to be a final scoring that takes place at this time. But before we get there, I want to point out one more rule that has to do with money. At any time during the game, a player can lose one point to gain 100 money. So if I was up here at 10 points, and I'm out of money for whatever reason, or I bid more money than I have, 
can't bid more money than you can ever obtain, I would have to move back and I take 100 money. And note that's only 100 money per point lost. So when you're completing those works, be careful because you're paying 200 money per point gained. So at the end of the seventh round, the game ends and players calculate the values of their prestige cards at this time and add them to their total. Here's an example of a prestige card. If you have two large buildings, you get five points. And they're all like this. For all the prestige you have and that you've completed, you gain the points. And those are just for yourself. Other players can't score points for your prestige cards. And then at the end of the game, whoever has the most prestige or points is the winner. Let's get going with this example playthrough. Players actually were dealt a hand of four profession cards, but they chose three, put one back in the deck, and it was reshuffled. And now we put the hands face up to make it easy to see, but normally they'd be for their players' eyes only. So we're going to begin the game in the auction phase. We know this player is going to go first because he is the start player marker, so he's going to pick a group to bid on and automatically start the bidding at 200. So he's going to go 200 on jesters, and this player can either increase the bet by exactly 100 or pass. So 300, 400, 500, 600. This guy is going to pass, so he can no longer enter the bid. This guy goes up to 700, and this guy is going to pass. So he pays that bid to the bank, 700 money, and he's going to take a jester and mark the group. Nobody else can ever bid on a group of jesters, but he's just going to keep that in his palazzo. Now, he can't bid on anything else, but it's going to go clockwise. Since this guy didn't buy anything, he now picks a group and bids on it. He's going to put 200 on parks. This guy isn't interested in parks, so he's just going to get the park for 200. Now, he immediately puts it in his area. He can put it anywhere on any of these empty spaces. He's just going to stick it here in the corner. And since this guy hasn't bought anything, he also gets to pick a group so he can buy whatever he wants for 200. And understanding he can't buy jesters or parks because those are already bought, he's going to bid his 200 on a builder. So he puts that builder to his area. Now it's only going to cost him 300 to build buildings. Now technically this player would mark that group since nobody else can bid on it, but the round is over so we're going to take all these back to their players and move on to the action phase. So we know this guy's going to go first because he's a start player marker, so he gets to take two actions. For his first one, he's going to buy a freedom, so he pays 300 because that's the cost of a freedom. He takes this travel freedom and puts it in his area. For his second action, he's going to complete a work. He's going to complete this poet. So we have to figure out how much value his work is going to have. And remember, it has to have at least seven for him to even be able to complete this because that's the minimum for this round. So for buildings, he clearly does not have the theater because he has no buildings, so no points there. Doesn't have the lake. He does have the freedom. So that itself is three points. And he does have a jester. So he's up to five points. And then for each card, six, seven, eight. So eight does exceed the maximum value. And for the rest of the game, this card's going to be face up in front of him unless somebody takes it out with a uh, recruiting card. But for the point being, this is going to mark the space eight on the board. He's not going to move this. Then he gets 800 florins or a combination of florins and points. He decides he only would like 400 florins. So he's going to take 400 florins. And that leaves room for two points for him that he's going to take immediately. And now we move on to the blue player's turn. For his first action, he's going to build a university. And that costs 700 because he doesn't have a builder. Remember, this guy would only have to pay 300 because he's got a builder. So he takes that and he's going to put a university in his area. And when you build something, you immediately get three points. So he's just going to move up three points like so. And remember, he can't place this adjacent to the plot, so he could certainly put it adjacent to a park or any type of landscape. But corner to corner is okay. That being said, he's going to put it up here in this corner. And for his second action, he's also going to complete a work. Let's see which one he's going to complete. He's going to complete this theologian. So he does have the building, so that's four points. He does have the park, so that's seven points. He doesn't have a freedom, though, or a jester, but eight, nine, ten. So he's going to mark up here at the ten, and he immediately gets to choose uh, how much money and points he'll take. He's going to take six money and two points. And then the red player is going to take a turn just like this, but we're going to jump ahead to the end of this round so you can see who got the best work. Welcome back. The red player just took his turn now because all players have taken an action. We get to see who has the best work. We can clearly see that the blue player had the highest work value for the turn, so he's immediately going to get three points. And everybody's just going to take these back. This is going to pass to the next player. We're going to start another round just like this one. We're going to jump ahead a little bit later in the game, though, so you can see some more interesting situations. Welcome back. We've progressed quite a bit in the game. It is now the sixth round, and it is this player's turn in the action phase. We just finished the auction phase. So for his first action, he's going to pay 300 to the bank, and he is going to draw from the profession deck. And when you draw from any deck in this game, you always draw five cards, and you look at them, pick one, and put the rest back in the bottom any order that you want. He's just going to take this physicist here and add it to his hand. And for his second action, he's going to pay 300 again, but he's going to go into the bonus card deck. Because remember, you can only take one profession per turn. So he's going to draw five bonus cards, look at them, choose one, and add it to his hand. So he decides to add this one to his hand because for each builder, he'll get two extra points when completing a work, and he has three builders, so he knows that's six extra points. And when you're completing work, you just discard these at the end to gain the points. So he adds that to his hand, but his two actions are done for this turn. So it's going to move on to the next guy. 
This next guy is also going to pay 300 to draw some profession cards from the deck, even though he has a recruiting card in his hand. So he looks at the cards, and he's going to pick one to add to his hand. So he picks this choreographer and puts the rest back on the bottom of the deck. And for a second action, he's going to complete a work, and it's going to be that choreographer. So the building is the opera, which he has, so that's four points. He doesn't have a forest, but he does have travel, so that's up to seven. And he has four jesters, so that's going to be eight more points at two points a jester. So that's 15 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, which exceeds the minimum value of 16. So we're going to mark that he's at 22. Also, I want to point out that with the recruiting card, he can just at any time place this in somebody else's area, not his, and take one of those cards to his hand. The recruiting card still counts as one point, though, for completing anything like you just saw. Out of that work value of 22, he could take 2,200 florins or any combination of florins and points. He decides to take 400 florins and leave the last nine for points. And the last guy's going to take a turn just like this, but we're going to jump ahead to the final situation so you can see the end of game scoring. Welcome back. We're pretty much at the end of the game. It's the red player's turn in the seventh round, and he just took his first action, which was to get a bonus card. So now for his second action, he's going to complete a work. He's going to complete this physicist, and he does have a laboratory, so that's four. He does have a forest, that's seven. He does have travel, so that's 10. He has no jesters, but he has eight, nine, 10, 11 in these cards, which we see is not enough. But then he is going to use two bonus cards, one extra point for each building, so that's 12, 13, 14, 15, and then two for each builder he has. He has three builders, so that's gonna end up with 21, and he's just gonna to toss those aside, and they're totally out of the game, and he's gonna mark 21. And then he's going to get 10 of that as points because it's the end of the game and the leftover will just be money. So he's going to go up to here. But at the end of the round, we see that the great player had the biggest work. So he's going to get plus three. So the final scoring is just the value of your prestige cards. This player has none. This guy over here has, um, if he has one building, one jester, and two landscapes, he gets seven points. He has his two landscapes his uh, builder and his jester's there, so he does get those seven points. And then lastly, this guy has a whole bunch of prestige cards. If he is the most builders, which he does, he has all three, he gets six points. And if he has the fewest empty spaces, which he does, compared to this guy, he gets eight points. So that's 14. And if he has two large buildings, which again, he does, he gets five. So that's gonna be 19 more points for him. I also wanna point out that if he was tied for certain things, there's a lower value in parentheses that he would get. So he's gonna move up by the 19 points he did get, which pushes him one point ahead of the great player and the victor. Princess of Florence is a game I enjoy quite a bit, but it's definitely not a game for everybody. It's on the heavier end and you definitely wanna make, you know, optimal moves, especially towards the end of the game and things like that. But there are a lot of paths to victory and the auction element makes things really interesting because there's definitely some things that are worth more than others. Notably, the jesters tend to be uh, very popular items, especially early in the game. But there's many different paths you can take to victory and there's a lot to kind of math out because because it definitely rewards skillful play. You know, you can build a lot of buildings, you can go for completing a lot of works and things like that. There's tons of ways to do it. And for the most part, a lot of the information, especially in a bigger game, is relatively public. Although there are face down decks of cards, you're drawing five and putting four back. So the decks aren't that big to begin with. So if you do it a couple of times, you tend to know everything that's in there. But that's more, you know, at, at, uh, once you've played it a couple of times and things like that. But if this one looks interesting to you, I definitely recommend it with the full complement of five. I feel it's best just because the auctions become way more dynamic, way more interesting. But uh, if you need to you, check it out. That's Princes of Florence.